श्री कृष्ण चंद्र भगवान की before we begin please take a moment to see that your mobile phones are in the flight mode because we shall be cruising at 30000 feet altitude wherever i go in the silicon valley the buzz is about artificial intelligence why is it so fascinating because of its ability to create and access knowledge at such rapid speeds this creation of knowledge has just exponentially increased as human society over the last 300 years has moved first from an agricultural based society where 90% of the people lived in the villages and the primary means of subsistence was off the land until the age of manufacturing came when factories were set up to mass produce goods and that changed the social economies completely but then things moved further ahead in the 20th century the manufacturing processes which had become the means of gaining stewardship of society as expressed by ralph waldo emerson when he said if you can make a better mouse trap the world will beat a road to your door but these manufacturing processes became common place and now differences were established by marketing and the world moved into the age of marketing subsequently with the development of computers again things changed people now had the ability to store lots of information to compute it and produce more and the age of marketing then moved on because the marketing channels had gotten clogged in any case to the age of information and that multiplied rapidly with the development of the world wide web the consequence was that three forces started interacting with each other the technological revolution the information revolution and the communication revolution as a result of which the information of half a million libraries became accessible through your internet connection and youngsters realized that through their little mobile sets they could actually access knowledge from around the world and with the technological revolution it could be stored computed upon to create more knowledge and with the communication revolution a little click of your mouse gave you the ability to transmit it straight from your email outbox to the email inboxes of literally thousands around the world and with social media that multiplied to millions so the consequence of all of this is that knowledge is being created rapidly transmitted to other researchers around who are then accessing it to create more knowledge and transmit it back 
This is like an avalanche that has been set into motion with no chance of stopping. People have to now ride the wave. And the world is well into the age of knowledge. While earlier, dominion was gained through physical resources, whether it was land or raw materials or human beings, the whole scenario has now changed. The biggest resource lies in the four inches between your two ears. Your ability to take the available knowledge and convert it into such knowledge that can add value to the lives of others. This is the knowledge-based economy. Interestingly, Sri Krishna, he described the importance of knowledge 5,000 years ago. When he said to Arjun, Nahi jnanena sadrisham pavitra mihavidyate. While the western world was still in the jungles, hunting with bows and arrows, 5,000 years ago, someone in Bharat had declared that Arjun, there is nothing as pure in this world as divine knowledge. And that is now getting realized as human society moves ahead. But when it comes to knowledge, we have so much of it. Silicon Valley has got stellar universities, whether it is Stanford or UC Berkeley, etc., there doesn't seem to be any shortage of the highest quality of knowledge. But how is it helping everybody here? Have all your problems been solved? Doesn't seem like the people in Silicon Valley are any happier than the poor people in the villages of India. I go there and they say, Are Baba Ji, I am so blessed. You find happiness on their faces. And then I come in the midst of the opulence and prosperity and the glut of the knowledge based society of Silicon Valley, and people say, Swaminji, I've got so many problems. Where is the gap? The problem is. We are enhancing material knowledge, which is providing us information about the external world, its laws, its energies, its phenomena, and how to harness this external for our comfort and luxury. But the mind within is not taken care of. And that mind, to address its issues, we need another kind of knowledge, which is spiritual knowledge. Albert Einstein. I believe we can accord him the status of one of the greatest scientists in history. He realized the limitations of material science when he said science has succeeded in denaturing the plutonium atom, but it cannot denature the evils in man's hearts. This evil within, we don't have the technology to denature it, even though we do have the technology to denature the plutonium atom, and manifest nuclear energy. So, to cleanse our hearts, to address the issues of our inner world, we need another kind of knowledge, which is spiritual knowledge. Very often in the Western world, these two are antagonistic and contradictory to each other. 
do you believe in science or do you believe in religion the vedas hold a different perspective they say dve vidye vedatavye para chaiva para cha there are two branches of vidyas or science one is material science and the other is spiritual science so the vedas don't say if you believe this you have to reject the other they say you can well accept both of these in your value system and in your life material science will enable you to utilize the external world for your needs and comforts spiritual science will help you enrich your inner world develop virtues and manifest the inner divinity of your soul so material knowledge is a plenty spiritual knowledge is what we have gathered here to discuss when it comes to spiritual knowledge there are certain limitations of the materialistic process the vedas point out how will you get material knowledge through research in your laboratories through experiments and observations they say no these processes have four inherent defects the first is bhram the second is pramad the third is karana patav and the fourth is vipralipsa what is that bhram is illusion there is a tendency to be deluded like for example you see water on the hot road ahead it's not there but a mirage is created as an illusion likewise there are so many illusions in this world everybody is thinking if only i can become a bollywood hollywood star how happy i will be the vedas say look all of these illusions you have a tendency to be ensnared by them this is the first defect in met in receiving spiritual knowledge by experience and the second is pramad the tendency to make mistakes now this happens all the time the first time nasa sent a vehicle towards mars mars was left one place and the vehicle went far off and the scientists they went back to their calculation boards and the head george muller he discovered a minus sign had been left out in one place all the scientists were humbled a mistake had been made this is pramad and the third is karana patav karana patav is the limitations of our own senses when we rely on what our senses are telling us we will think that the skin is smooth while well, factually it is not a microscope will reveal that it is far from smooth so this is the limitation of our senses which the vedas say karana patav and the fourth is vipralipsa vipralipsa is the tendency to cheat so every once in a while a scientist makes a declaration not because they discovered something new but because it what it would win them name and fame so this is the vipra lipsa the cheating propensity and the veda say look the knowledge which you wish to access if it has even one defect it becomes unreliable 
you want to base your life on knowledge that is completely free from blemish such knowledge will require the descending process you reach a perfect source and from that source if you can receive the knowledge on day 1 you will have access to blemish less wisdom fortunately for us in our culture such wisdom is profusely available for anybody willing to have faith the vedas are such descending knowledge they are called a paurusheya a paurusheya means no human being created them they are directly the knowledge the gyana shakti of god and they were passed down through the year by the oral tradition so they became known as shruti and 5000 years ago ved vyas he realized that the people of kalyug will not be shruti dhari they will not have the ability to hear and remember in fact people forget so fast within a minute they have forgotten you cross the security at the airport and you forget your mobile there and people are announcing a blue mobile has been left realizing that the atms when you put in your credit card before dispensing you the money they say pull your credit card out because they know that some people will forget that they put the credit card in within one minute they'll have forgotten ved vyas knew that the people of kalyug will not be shruti dhari so he put the vedas in writing and divided them into four parts nobody ever calls him the writer rachaita they all call him ved vyas the divider of the already existing vedas those vedas are the ultimate authority for spiritual principles in our sanatan dharma bhutam bhavyam bhavishyancha sarvan vedat prasiddhyati the veracity of any spiritual principle needs to be validated on the authority of the vedas otherwise any swami ji baba ji guru ji pandit ji mahamandaleshwar will come and say anything and how do you know what they are saying is blemishless knowledge it is credible it is authentic or is it a personal opinion so that is why vedas are kept if it matches with the vedas it can then be accepted these vedas their knowledge is very esoteric the upanishads are a section of the vedas and scholars and philosophers around the western world when they got access to it from the 18th century onwards they all unanimously acclaimed it schopenhauer when he read the upanishads he put them on his head and started dancing and said there is no philosophy in the world as elevating as that of the upanishads it has been the solace of my life and it shall be the solace of my death and then max muller he was commissioned by the east india company to write commentaries on the vedic scriptures and deliberately distort them to break people's faith but his study in fact transformed him and after 40 years of writing commentaries he also writes if these words of schopenhauer require any confirmation i shall gladly give it as the result of my lifelong study and henry david thoreau you know the philosopher from new england in the northeast america he said 
I daily bathe my intellect in the timeless wisdom of the Gita. It is as if an empire speaks to me. So that is the way Western philosophers have praised these scriptures. The irony is that people from Bharat have forgotten its glory. Nevertheless, <laughs> these Upanishads are a reference source for divine wisdom. But because they are so complex, they have been elaborated in a plethora of other scriptures, including the two Itihas, Ramayana and Mahabharat, 18 Puranas, like the Bhagavad Puran, Vishnu Puran, Skand Puran, Ling Puran, Surya Puran, Agni Puran, Padma Puran, Markandeya Puran, Brahma Puran, Brahma Vaivartak Puran, Agni Puran, Surya Puran, etc. The Shad Darshan, the six scriptures written by six sages. Maharshi Jaimini, he wrote the Mimansa Darshan. Maharshi Vedvyas wrote the Vedant Darshan. Maharshi Gautam. He wrote the Nyay Darshan, Maharshi Kanad wrote the Vaisheshik Darshan, Maharshi Kapil wrote the Sankhya Darshan and Maharshi Patanjali wrote the Yoga Darshan. Then we have the hundred Smritis and beyond that we have thousands of Nibans. This entire Parampara is called Nigam. Likewise, we also have the Agam scriptures. You hear of Nigam and Agam. This form the body of Vedic scriptures, which is like a vast ocean. If anybody wishes to understand what is the way to spiritual perfection, what is the spiritual perfection? What is the methodology to reach it? And you wish to understand through all these scriptures, it will take you 500 years. Now another problem with Kali Yuga is that we don't have such long lives. Within a hundred years, Ram Nam Satya hai happens. So that is why <laughs> Acharyas determined three gateways to understand that Vedic wisdom. These became the prasthantrai, three entry points to Vedic knowledge. And all the great Acharyas wrote commentaries on it. Shankara Acharya, Madhva Acharya, Ramanuja Acharya, Nimbarka Acharya, Vallabha Acharya. So the prasthantrai one is the Upanishads, the Ekadash Upanishad. Shankaracharya wrote commentaries on them. The second is the Brahma Sutra. And the third is the Bhagavad Gita. Through these, you can go deeper into the Vedic philosophy. Even in these are modern Kaliyugi brain finds it difficult to comprehend the Upanishads. Nevertheless, to some extent we do. People ask me, Swamiji, why are Indians so expert in IT? They are not like best in the world when it comes to communication, social skills, etc. But in matters of IT, People realize that Indians seem to have this innate ability. I tell them, look, for thousands of years, they have been grappling with the abstract concepts of the Upanishads. So the virtual IT space does not seem alien to them. They can easily handle it. Nevertheless, the Upanishads are difficult and the Brahma Sutra or the Vedanta Darshan is even more difficult. All the Acharyas did write their commentaries, but for a common person, it's not easy to comprehend. And that then makes Bhagavad Gita the indispensable source of Vedic knowledge. Bhagavad Gita is not the part of the Vedas. 
it is a part of mahabharat and it has got only 700 verses while the ashtadash puran have got 400000 verses but firstly it is directly the word of god shri krishna has spoken and that is why it is descending knowledge of the highest quality so it is respected as the fifth veda it is respected at the level of the upanishads themselves it is called gitopanishad that is why the gita mahatmya says sarvopanishado gavo dogdha gopalanandana the upanishads are like the cow and gopal nandan shri krishna the milkman he is milking the upanishads and bestowing that amrit like nectar like knowledge to arjun so, astonishingly 5000 years have gone by and philosopher after philosopher has studied that and find that the depth of this is unfathomable you just get layer after layer of understanding so every year hundreds of books are printed referencing the bhagavad gita somebody comes out with a book stress management from the bhagavad gita somebody else comes out with leadership lessons from the bhagavad gita it goes on and on and on if the bhagavad gita was not transcendental knowledge 5000 years would have been a long time for it to get outdated for it to become irrelevant but what we see is the reverse its relevance and practical utility only seems to keep growing that is because of the source from which it has come and in those 700 verses all the vedic philosophy has been encapsulated including the shad darshan so there are the various kinds of yogas now to bestow such profound knowledge a very intricate background setting was required and the mahabharat provided exactly that setting it was a war between two warring cousins who were so dominant in the bharatvarsh of that time that all the kings of the land were obliged to align with one or the other side and that war was about to begin providing the ideal setting for shri krishna to bestow that knowledge now shri krishna deliberately created this ignorance within arjun he was fully determined to fight and he had gone to dwarka to take shri krishna's help you have heard of the episode that shri krishna was in dwarka before the war when arjun and duryodhan both came to canvas his support and shri krishna knowing it all because he is residing in the hearts of both arjun and duryodhan he pretended to be asleep when they came arjun in his humbleness he came and sat down at the feet of shri krishna duryodhan arrived at the same time but in his arrogance he sat by shri krishna's head and finally when shri krishna opened his eyes he saw are arjun you are here duryodhan said i am also here oh, welcome 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 so they expressed what the matter was and shri krishna said look you are both my cousins and samoham sarvabhuteshu i will not be prejudiced towards anyone 
So you have the choice. One side will be my one Akshohani Yadu army and one side I will be there without lifting weapons. But because I saw Arjun first, he gets the first choice. Arjun said, there is no question of any doubt. I choose you, Sri Krishna. So Arjun was determined and he was in full knowledge. However, when the war was about to start, he fell into confusion. Oh my God, Sri Krishna, how can I fight this war? Sri Krishna said, why? All my venerable elders, so in the war they will get killed. So their wives will become widows. So there will be unwanted progeny. So the consequence will be I will get sin and I will go to hell. Now this is the confusion that Arjun presents before Sri Krishna. <coughs> we can, if we ponder a little, ask Arjun, that did you not know before this point in time who is going to fight from the other side? <coughs> no, no, I knew very well. Did you not know that in the war you will be killing them? <laughs> I knew that also. Did you not know that if they die, their wives will become widows? <laughs> that also I knew. Then why did you not say no to the war earlier on? This is like somebody, a witness from our side, goes into the court, stands in the witness box and changes sides. But the point was, it was orchestrated by Sri Krishna as the perfect setting. Now there's this huge dilemma. One is a moral dilemma. Deeper is an ethical dilemma. And Arjun is facing an ethical dilemma. Its moral dilemmas are easy to resolve. You know, protect women, protect the elders. Ethical dilemmas require deep philosophical thought. And Arjun has presented his doubts his confusion to Sri Krishna. This becomes the setting of the Bhagavad Gita. Sri Krishna utilized that occasion, creating a window out of it to not only resolve Arjun's doubts, but also through the window show Arjun the entire gamut of the Absolute Truth. So the Bhagavad Gita takes us on a dig darshan, revealing to us Brahma Vidya, knowledge of the Supreme Divine Reality. And Sri Krishna does not stop at that. He goes further to give us methodologies for implementing this knowledge in our lives. And that is why Bhagavad Gita is alongside with being called Brahma Vidya, it is also called Yoga Shastra. Brahma Vidya and Yoga Shastra. It is helping us know the absolute truth and practice the yoga processes for attaining the absolute truth for ourselves. Such an amazing scripture is the Gita. It has got 18 chapters in it. Each chapter is titled interestingly by Vedavyas as Yog. Now you will say, how does Vedavyas come into the picture? The reason is, that while Arjun and Sri Krishna were in conversation on the battleground of Kurukshetra, Sanjay was the minister of Dhritarashtra who had the ability for clairvoyance and he could see what was happening from afar. So what was being discussed, he was relating to the blind king Dhritarashtra. And Sanjay was a disciple of Vedavyas. The powers he possessed had come from his guru. 
and his guru was well equipped to be aware of the conversation for himself and that is why ved vyas wrote it down so it is there in the bhagavad gita in the mahabharat and ved vyas has titled each of the 18 chapters as yog yog is that state of union of our mind with the supreme when our consciousness unites with the supreme consciousness that is yog and the way to achieve that union the process is also called yog so the first chapter for example is called arjun vishad yog arjun is in despair this is arjun vishad but ved vyas says arjun vishad yog that despair has become a springboard for arjun's enlightenment and hence the first chapter is also yog and then he goes on so the word yog figures 150 times in the 700 verses of the bhagavad gita each of those chapters yog etc they are all superlative chapter 6 stands out chapter 6 is dhyan yog the yoga of meditation and that is the one that has been selected for this life transformation program for our discussion we are now getting into the bhagavad gita chapter 6 i believe those of you who registered for the course you must have received chapter 6 pdf did you receive the pdf yeah okay good show and if you did not kindly register and you will get the pdf i will say the verse you please repeat after me chapter 6 verse 1 अनाश्रित कर्म फल कार्य कर्म कौतीसी योगी च निराग्निर्नचाक्रिय ट्रांसलेशन द सुप्रीम लॉर्ड सेड ही हु अंडरटेक्स एक्शन विदाउट अटैचमेंट टू द फ्रूट इज बोथ अ सन्यासी रिनंसियंट एंड अ योगी नॉट ही who has merely renounced the sacrificial fire or given up all activity what a beautiful verse to start our discussion with remember arjun wanted to run away and shri krishna explained to him that he needs to fight now shri krishna is explaining to arjun you don't become a sanyasi merely by renouncing the fire the fire he is referring to is the fire used in karma kand where you have the agni hotra yagyas etc the fire is burnt as a part of the rituals now the rule for the sanyasi is that you reject karma kand a somebody in the renounced order of life sanyasi goes to the extent of rejecting even the janeu the sacred thread nothing further to do with karma kand so shankaracharya emphasized you must renounce the fire which shri krishna preceded shankaracharya he is not contradicting but say that is an external thing whether you have renounced the fire or not the real thing is have you become detached from inside 
mere renunciation is external things will not do you can go and sit in the himalayas in a cave if your mind is attached you will still be thinking of all the travails of silicon valley on the other hand if you have freed your mind from attachment you can be a yogi and a sanyasi while living right here one lady widow went to ramakrishna paramahans and said i wish to live in vrindavan sacred land of shri krishna ram krishna paramahans said that's very well but your mind is attached to your son who lives in kolkata physically you will be in vrindavan and your mind will be with your son in kolkata you will not get the fruit of living in vrindavan but the fruit of living in kolkata where your mind is instead of that you live in kolkata and take your mind there you get this understand that whether it is renunciation or it is yog in both cases the union of the mind is important some people say swami ji we love the stories that you say because it helps us retain the message one husband and wife went to a party and people were becoming a bit uncomfortable and the wife noticed the reason was her husband's socks were stinking so she said you know your socks are stinking worse than a pig go to the restroom and take them out he went to the restroom took the socks out and came back and after 5 minutes the wife said your socks are your still the stink is not gone what is the matter he said i took my socks out and i put them in my pocket <laughs> <laughs> so those socks are still in the pocket the stink remains likewise the important thing is not the renunciation of the fire but the finishing of the attachment of the mind when the mind is clinging that is the problem the clinging can be of two kinds one is rag and the other is dvesh rag means in positive affection if while listening to the lecture your mind goes repeatedly to chai that means your attachment is to chai and the mind is clinging to it someone asked me swami ji why is it that in america in the office everybody talks about their dog i said because the mind is attached to the dog so wherever the mind is clinging that is the phenomenon of rag but even more difficult to give up than rag is dvesh negative attachment bitterness resentment hatred this person did bad to me so terrible the vedas categorize rag and dvesh into one category and they say both of them together form rag so rag means rag plus dvesh and vairagya means vigata rag free from rag free from attachment and hatred both of these will need to be given up the person who has done that shri krishna says that person sa sanyasi cha yogi cha arjun that person may be wearing suit and pant but will qualify both as a sanyasi and as a yogi let's go to the next verse 6.2 
Yam Sanyasamitiprahur Yam Sanyasamitiprahur Yogam Tam Vidhi Pandava Yogam Tam Vidhi Pandava Nahya Sanyasta Sankalpo Yogi Bhavati Kashchana Yogi Bhavati Kashchana What is called sannyas, renunciation, is no other than yoga. For none can become a yogi without renouncing worldly desires. Now, in spirituality, there are two things. One is yoga and the other is vairagya. What is yoga? So yoga is not yoga. Now we've got so many yogas in America, right? With typical American innovative genius. We've got goat yoga. A person is made to lie down and a goat walks on their back. This is goat yoga. (laughs) And hot yoga, of course, is a tremendous commercial enterprise. When I was in Maryland, in the year 2010, my host said, Swamiji, let me take you to an American yoga studio. So I said, this will be exciting because I am going to be teaching. So let me see how do they do it. He said, don't tell anybody I am a yoga teacher. So I removed my tilak, tied my hair in the back, put on shorts and a (laughs) t-shirt. And we went. I said, where are we going? He said, we are going for hot yoga. I said, you mean hot yoga? No, no, I mean hot yoga. (laughs) I said, all right, let's see what is this hot yoga. And when we reached there, the studio, the room, temperature was 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So I grew up in Delhi, you know, where the temperature was commonly 112 degrees Fahrenheit. (laughs) And when I was growing up, there were no ACs. So it was no big deal. Only thing was at 112, we never did yoga. And out here at 105, they're making us work like this. Why are they driving us so hard? Swamiji, everybody has paid $28 for the class. So I said, okay, let's go on. After one hour, 15 minutes, I was pretty exhausted. The teacher said, now lie down. I said, thank God. Ha. <laughs> I said, where is the yoga in all of this? This is just a physical drill. Somebody is doing it for weight reduction. Somebody is doing it as a beauty aid. <laughs> there is no word called yoga in Sanskrit. The word is yoga. And yoga means union. So this yoga refers to the union of this individual soul with the supreme soul. Sanyogo yoga ityukto jivatma paramatmano. The Garud Puran says, Sanyogo yoga ityukto. In Ayurveda, when you combine two medicines, that is called yoga, the linking. So that linking will not be by shaking hands with God. It will be by attaching our mind to Him, which will take our consciousness to Him. Now the only way you can take your mind to God is by detaching it from the world. If the mind is attached to the world, how will you take it to God? There is one mind, It will either be attached here or there. Some people say, Swamiji, man bhagavad me nahi lagta. My mind doesn't stay in God. So I say, where does it stay? Does it stay in the world? No, it doesn't stay in the world also. And it doesn't stay in God also. Really? Then does it hang in pending in between somewhere? Ari Baba, this mind is such, it will definitely be attached here or there. 
इट कैन नॉट बी इन अ स्टेट ऑफ एनिमेटेड सस्पेंशन कबीरा मनुआ एक है भावे जहाँ लगाय भावे हरि की भक्ति कर भावे विषय कमाए सो इफ द माइंड इज नॉट स्टेइंग इन गॉड द ओनली रीजन इज इट इज अटैच टू द वर्ल्ड इधर राग और द्वेष दे कैन बी नो अदर रीजन इट्स पॉसिबल दैट अटैचमेंट इज सटल you are not able to with your self awareness detect what is this attachment that is sabotaging my bhagavat chintan but that is what is coming in the way and if you wish to progress in spirituality and actually become a yogi you will have to detach the mind if god had given us two three minds we could have attached one here one there it would not be a problem you know keep one attached to rasgullas one you keep it attached to video games one to beta beti and with one mind you engage in bhakti but god was smart he knew that if he gives us multiple minds like he gave us multiple fingers two eyes if he had given us multiple minds we would not have done mam ekam sharanam raj complete surrender that is why as the gopi said to udhav udho manana bhaye 10 20 ek hu to so गयो शाम संग को अवराधे स ऊध जी मन न भय दस बीस उद्धव जी वी डोंट हैव टेन ट्वेंटी माइंड्स वी हैव ओनली वन माइंड एंड दैट माइंड हैज गॉन टू मथुरा विद योर फ्रेंड श्री कृष्ण हु हैज सेंट यू आउट हियर सो उद्धव जी this sadhana which you are telling us with which mind should we do it now that one mind in one time can only be attached to one place hasab thuthai phula ab galu dui ki hui ek sang bhualu try when you after the lecture when you go home try to laugh loudly and also blow your cheeks you will discover you can't do both things together either blow your cheeks or laugh loudly so the saying says just like both these cannot happen concomitantly likewise your mind cannot simultaneously be attached to the world and also to god if you aspire for yoga you will have to seriously think how you can detach your mind from the world and then you will achieve success in yoga i want to go rapidly so we'll take one more verse to wet your appetite a little further number 3 arurukshor muner yogam कर्म कारण मुच्यते योगारूढ़ शम कारण मुच्यते ट्रांसलेशन टू दी एस्पायरिंग सोल work without attachment is said to be the means to the sage who is already elevated in yog cessation of material activities is said to be the means now this is a very deep verse if you want to understand it i will require your undivided attention shri krishna is telling arjun to work 
and why did he tell arjun when arjun realized that my goal is not material as shri krishna explained then arjun said then why fight all this war that it doesn't make sense let me go into the jungle take sanyas shri krishna i will also go into the jungle and practice sadhana there shri krishna said arjun listen you are driven by your nature by nature you are a warrior an administrator a leader of men that is your intrinsic propensity now you say okay i will take sanyas you will go into the jungle there also you will do the same thing you will gather the adivasis and you say okay i am now the king of the adivasis you all listen to what i am saying that nature will not change so instead of artificially renouncing arjun you stay where you are you work as according to your propensities and learn to give up attachment from the inside so this was the logic shri krishna presented this renunciation now the question arises that should we keep working all our life Shri Krishna has drawn a limit to it. It's not required. When you are on the first stages, you do karma yoga. Alongside with karma, you do yoga. But when you have become a sage of steady mind, yoga rude, then you can renounce all karma, because ultimately it's a waste of time. when you are the soul and your connection is with god then why not engage purely in spiritual activities don't do it artificially many people when they experience misery in the world they say oh this world is all useless and i'll swami ji make me also swami ji <laughs> when i used to give lectures in india about 30 years ago It's a very deeply spiritual environment. Every time four or five youngsters would come, Swami Ji, I wish to renounce the world. But the point was, were they actually in a state of renunciation? Very often, it's the miseries of the world that is the motivation. I am getting so many miseries, and I wish to run away from them. and when they take sanyas and they experience misery is there then they say this is more miserable now we run away from here as well <laughs> shri krishna calls this a rajasik tyag dukha mitevaya karma karyam karma karoti ya dukha mitev yat karma kaya klesha भयात्यजेत स कृत्वा राजसम त्यागम नैव त्याग फलम लभेत व्हेन यू रन अवे फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड बिकॉज यू फील इट इज मिजरेबल दैट इज नॉट ट्रू रिनाउंसिएशन ट्रू रिनाउंसिएशन मींस यू राइज अप अप इट विद द मिजरीज आर नॉट अफेक्टिंग यू इट डजंट मैटर दैट इज ट्रू रिनाउंसिएशन नाउ यू आर एलिजिबल फॉर सन्यास so shri krishna says until then do karma yoga arjun but then arjun says should i keep on working in silicon valley all my life shri krishna isn't there and limit to it so shri krishna says first you were yoga rukshu when you become yoga rude that's the term he is used when you become a sage of steady mind then there is no need to waste time any further now you can just chuck it all and say okay now shri krishna all day long i'll do radhe radhe but you have to qualify for that so we have taken off in the chapter of dhyan yoga it's a very exciting chapter because shri krishna is now going to tell us so many important things 
as regards to meditation etc 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 we look forward to discussing these in the remaining six lectures of the seven day series shri krishna chandra bhagwan ki yeah.